Uh, welcome to our second week of lessons. Uh, we're going to actually do some real physics this week. Um, I'm sure you found the work on uncertainties absolutely fascinating, but we're going to start off by looking at uh, electric and magnetic fields. That will involve a little bit of revision from National 5, um, and it will include some new material as well to, to move forward with. To give you an idea of where we're going with this, we're going to be looking at using particle accelerators as a context uh, for electric fields and magnetic fields as well for that matter. Um, and we're going to go on then to look at um, a little bit actually of quantum physics, but we're not going to call it quantum physics. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll leave that for another time. In higher, we will be looking at some of the groundwork that we're going to need for our study of quantum physics in advanced higher, and we'll try and make that explicit as we go. Okay, so without further ado, let's start to look at electric fields. That's all we're going to do this week. We'll leave magnetic fields for next week. Um, and because we're going to use a particle accelerators or a context, we'll have a quick look at the different types of particles accelerators just first um, very quickly. Um, and we're going to look at what they are and what they do. Um, so physicists are not particularly imaginative or creative at times. So as the name suggests, a particle accelerator, well, it accelerates particles. Um, so it takes charged particles and increases their velocity. Um, to actually very high velocities and therefore very high energies. Now, why do we do this? There's actually two reasons for this. One of which is um, accelerating charges can, will release um, X-rays and gamma rays, and they're useful in their own right. Um, so if you go to uh, you know, Dr. Gray's hospital for an X-ray, there's a little particle accelerator that will produce uh, X-rays. Um, um, so that's useful. The other thing is to actually try and probe what matter's made from, and that's kind of where this unit's going. So the basic idea is that is actually fairly low brow. If you wonder what a, a kinder egg is made from, you can just smash it on the ground and see what the little bits that are left behind are. And that's more or less what we're doing with particles. If we accelerate them to very high velocities and smash them into each other, we can maybe see what they're made of. Um, Maybe it doesn't seem particularly intelligent, but that, that's that's the way it works, and it's actually stood us in good stead so far. Um, particle accelerators use electric and or magnetic fields to produce the forces and required to accelerate the particles. So this is obviously going to be heavily focused on forces. Uh, the origin of those forces does come from the electric and magnetic fields, um, and that's really the, the physics we're trying to teach in this section. Okay. Um, and because of my ugly mug in the way, you can't see, so I'm just going to get rid of that. So, protons, uh, I'll ignore the word in brackets, hadrons. We're going to come back to look at what hadrons are, but keep in mind Large Hadron Collider, which is a particle accelerator uh, in Europe, um, or positive nuclei, so large ions, something like could be like a helium nucleus, or even electrons can be accelerated. So all of these particles have a charge which enables them to be manipulated. Okay, let's have a look at the types. Uh, the oldest type, first of all, is the linear accelerator, such as uh, LINAC in Sanford. Um, linear because, guess what, it's a straight line. There you go, there it is. Um, we, we have particles produced at one end, and then we have alternating electric fields across the length of the accelerator where we have a target at the far end. Now, in terms of the energies we can produce, we're kind of limited by the length of the tunnel. The longer the tunnel, the higher the energy, um, because over the length of the tunnel, we can have a greater number of acceleration points because we're using multiple electric fields within the length of this tunnel to accelerate the particles. Um, so length of the tunnel is the defining character of the energy there. It's an older design. We've moved on a little bit now, although there is still some very interesting physics being done in these older accelerators, but in order to probe deeper into what matter is made of, we do need more modern designs. Um, we've all men already mentioned the cyclotron. Um, cyclotron is an interesting device. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how well I explain this on a video with a PowerPoint. Um, effectively, we've got this pipe in the middle. 
on this diagram. And this pipe is our source of charged particles. So let's just assume for a moment it's an electron or electrons are coming out of here. Now, between the two halves, we've got these two semicircular. These are again imaginatively called Ds because they're D-shaped. So between these two Ds, we have an electric field. Now, the electric field causes the particle to accelerate from one D to the other. Now, we'll see later on in the course that magnetic fields can be used to uh, steer charged particles into circular paths. So within the, the D, we have a magnetic field which causes the particle to follow a circular path. Now, the electric field across the gap is actually an alternating one. So it's constantly changing polarity. We've got an AC power supply down here. So by the time the particle comes back, the direction of the electric field has changed and the particle again accelerates across the gap. So every time it crosses this gap between the two Ds, it's accelerated and its velocity increases. Now, because its velocity increases, um, but the time it, which it stays inside the D doesn't change. So we have a larger velocity, but the time inside the D doesn't change. We'll look at why in advanced higher. Then it has to, every time the velocity increases, the radius of curvature, so the size of the circle it's traveling in has to increase. So we have this circular path, it accelerates again, it follows a larger circular path, it accelerates again. It follows a larger circular path, it accelerates again. And you can see that the charge spirals outwards. Now, this continues until the particle reaches the edge of the D. So once it comes to the edge, it can leave the D, travel in a straight line, unaffected by the electric and magnetic fields. In the case of uh, medical cyclotrons, we've got a target here. Um, depends on the application, but just thinking about production of X-rays and gamma rays, we'd have a target here in the collision of the charges and the, the target would produce your X-rays and gamma rays. You can see from this design, though, that the larger the velocity of the charged particle, so in this case, maybe an electron, um, the larger the velocity, the larger its radius of curvature, so the larger the size of the circle it travels in. So the limiting factor in terms of the energies we can produce in the cyclotron is actually the size of the Ds themselves. So very small Ds, you can have something that can fit in the palm of your hand, you can have something that can fit on a tabletop or very much larger. Um, not particularly a practical way to produce um, high energy particles, good enough for places like hospitals, but perhaps not enough to uh, discover the Higgs boson. To do that, we have to move on to the third type, which is the synchrotron. Now, <laughs> this is a, obviously a much bigger beast. So we might use things like linear accelerators and uh, cyclotrons to get an initial supply of charged particles moving. But after that, we have a large circular path and the, the electric and magnetic fields that control the path of the charged particles in this path means that we can actually have two beams. We can have beams traveling in different directions. So we can maybe have one traveling clockwise, one traveling anti-clockwise, and then we can arrange for those beams to collide. Now, the beams get very close to the speed of light. Um, so we'd maybe have one beam of particles traveling very close to the speed of light and hit by another beam of particles traveling in the opposite direction, traveling very close to the speed of light. So we're producing much bigger energies than we would in the other types of uh, particle accelerator. The limiting factor again with this accelerator is the length of the tunnel. So you can see from this one, 16.8 miles underground mostly. Um, and that's what limits the energy that can be produced by this type of accelerator. Plans are underfoot for a much bigger version of the Large Hadron Collider, but that is very much just at the planning stage. Okay, so that's our different types of particle accelerators. We're going to shelve the discussion on those just for the moment. We will come back to look at what particle accelerators have taught us, but 
before we do that, we just need to look a little bit about the physics of how we're accelerating and steering these particles within a particle accelerator. And this will form the bulk of, you know, the, the types of questions you might see in exams. Um, what we've discussed so far and what we're going to discuss about uh, the fundament, fundamental nature of matter lends itself to, you know, explain and using your knowledge of physics type questions that, that will come up at higher as well. Okay. Hopefully we covered this at National 5, but if we didn't, we'll just ask the very simple question, what is a field? Um, in physics, a field is, um, I suppose, partly a mathematical concept. So a field is any region in space where a particle experiences a force. There are, of course, different types of of fields. There are electric fields, there are magnetic fields, and there are gravitational fields are the ones we'll be looking at predominantly. In the case of an electric field, it means only a particle that has an electric charge will experience a force. So if you have a neutron passing through an electric field, it will not experience a force at all. Likewise, a magnetic field is a region in which a moving electric charge experiences a field. We'll come back to that one because this one's not the magnetic field is a little bit more um, interesting, should we say, than the electric field. Uh, magnetic fields revolve around the interactions between moving charges and the field. Um, we are going to mention gravitational fields. What we've done on gravity so far, thinking back to National 5 and uh, potential energy and kinetic energy, is going to be very useful in helping us get our heads around what comes next. So we'll look at that again. So um, one of the demonstrations we might have been able to do if we were in class would be to look at an example of a, an electric field. We've got this simple experimental setup there. You can see where we use a high voltage between the two bars and we can use seeds that line up along electric field lines, a little bit like looking at magnetic field lines in first year where we sprinkle down filings and a bit of paper and we can see the field lines. We can do the same thing with electric field lines. Definitely encourage you to watch the video so you can see it happening. Um, and help make it a little bit clearer to you and give you a picture of what's going on. But the key thing is between those two bars in the dish, we do have an electric field and any charged particles in that region will experience a force. OK, so quick bit of revision from National 5. Um, you should be familiar with the electric field patterns around a point charge. So if you recall, electric field lines have a direction associated with them and they show the direction of the force on a positive test charge. So if you're trying to think about electric fields, imagine just taking uh, a positive charge. You could think of maybe just a proton if it makes it easier and bringing it into the field and measuring the magnitude and the direction of the force on that proton at that point in the field. So hopefully if you look at the positive charge, it's should be fairly obvious to think that if we put a proton here, well, light charges repel each other. So the direction of the force will be directly away from the positive charge in the middle. And no matter where we put that proton around the positive charge, the force will be directly away from it. So we get this field pattern here. We can also see that the field lines are closer together. The nearer we get to the charge, that means the force is stronger. As we get further away from the charge, the force gets weaker. More on that again in advanced higher. Um, same pattern for a negative charge, but of course this time unlike charges attract each other. So the, the direction of the arrows changes to show that this force is now attractive. So our positive test charge will experience a force in the direction of the negative charge there. Um, we also have to be aware of the electric field pattern between two charged plates. So we've got this pattern here. We've got a positively charged plate and we've got a negatively charged plate. It's worth spending a minute just discussing this. So when we added positive charge to this plate, the positive charges would have repelled each other. So they would have spread out equally across the plate. That's the way they can get as far as possible away from each other. Same on the negative plate here. So the distribution of charge on both plates is uniform. <clears throat> now, because of that, we've got a symmetrical relationship. So the electric field line throughout most of the plates traveled directly from the positive plate to the negative plate. If I put a positive charge here, then it will experience a force that is perpendicular 
to the two plates and is in the direction away from the positive plate and towards the negative plate. These field lines are equally spaced. And this tells us that anywhere within this region we put a charge, it will experience a uniform force. The force will be the same no matter where we put it. We could put it here towards the positive plate, here towards the negative plate. We could put it over here, over here, over here, over here. Anywhere we want, the charge is going to experience the same force. Um, not expected to understand this at higher, um, although I have seen it creep into assessment before, but at the edges of the plates, we do have these bulging lines outwards. So normally at higher, we just ignore this. Um, but because we don't have any more plate over here, we do start to experience horizontal components of forces. Um, but we can usually ignore that. It's worth knowing they're there, but most of the time you'll just see the ends of the plate just not shown. Okay, <clears throat> so let's try and draw some comparisons between what we already know on gravitational fields and linking it to electric fields. So let's consider a mass moving vertically in a gravitational field. So if we have a mass that is at some height h above the ground and we let it go, then its weight downwards produces an unbalanced force. And this causes it to accelerate vertically downwards. Now, where is the energy gained from the mass coming from. So the mass is accelerating downwards, its potential energy is converting to kinetic energy. Well, what's actually happening is the gravitational field of Earth is doing work on the mass. So by doing work, it's causing it to accelerate and it's giving it kinetic energy. So <clears throat> the work done is equal to the force times the distance. Well, the force is its weight, so its weight is its mass times gravitational field strength, G. And the distance is, well, it's the height it falls, it's H. So the work done is equal to M times G times H, which, funnily enough, was our equation for potential energy in National 5. So that's where it comes from. So the change in potential energy is equal to the work done, and that's the energy gains. Now, in National 5, we would then go on and talk about, well, how fast is it going when it hits the ground? And in National 5, we would recognise that um, all of the potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. Kinetic energy equals half mv squared. We know what the total amount of kinetic energy is because we can calculate that. And then it's fairly straightforward, hopefully, to work back to get the velocity. OK. And that's it summarised just pictorial. So. EP equals MGH converts to E equals half MV squared. Now let's do exactly the same thing, but with an electric field. Okay, so let's look at electrons being linearly, so in a straight line, accelerated in an electric field. Well, in the same way as the gravitational field did work on the mass, the electric field does work on the charged particle. So that work is actually equal to the charge in the particle times the voltage through which it's been accelerated. So if we've got two plates and they have 100 volts between the plates, then the voltage through which the charge has been accelerated is 100 volts. And then we can multiply that voltage by the charge to get the, um, the energy change on that particle. Okay. In exactly the same way as the potential energy is equal to the work done by the field, and that energy converts to kinetic energy, the same thing happens here. So the work done by the electric field is equal to the potential energy of the particle before it goes through the field, and that converts to kinetic energy, and we get exactly the same formulas that we do in uh, National 5. We can therefore calculate in the same way as in National 5, we can calculate the velocity of the particle. We'll either have a standard particle like a proton or electron. The masses of those are in your data sheets, or you'll be told the mass of the particle in the question. So hopefully it should be fairly straightforward. Fingers crossed, although you're probably wrinkling your foreheads just now a little bit. Okay, let's have a look at an example. Charge moving in an electric field. 
Okay, so an electron is accelerated in an electric field from the cathode, so the negative terminal, to an anode, negative, the positive terminal, an electron gun, by a potential difference, i.e. voltage of 5,000 volts. Okay, so the cathode and anode don't look like the parallel plates you looked at before. They do look a little bit different. So let's stop for a second and have a look at the design. So the cathode is still a plate. It's, okay, it's a circular plate rather than a square plate in this diagram. The anode looks a little bit different. It's like a tube. Now, because of symmetry inside the tube, the forces on the electrons cancel out. So there's effectively zero force inside this tube because we have rotational symmetry around the electron beam. Um, and it, likewise, we can ignore any forces once the electron beam leaves it. So it's traveling through the anode, but this still behaves like a plate that's located, you know, around about this point here. So let's have a look at the questions. We've been asked to determine A, the work done on the electron by the field, B, the kinetic energy of the electron after it passes through the anode, and C, the speed of the electron when it exits the anode. So let's have a look at the questions and we're given some data there. So first of all, A, well, the work done by the field is equal to the charge on the electron times the voltage. I'll let you substituting the numbers yourself, but it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 multiplied by 5,000. And that comes out at 8 times 10 to the minus 16 joules. B, well, what's the kinetic energy? Well, the kinetic energy, this is only one mark, is equal to the work done. So it's 8 times 10 to the minus 16 joules, just state it. And then the final one, well, we have the speed of the electron when it exits the anode. Um, we use our formula, E equals half mv squared. We know E is 8 times 10 to the minus 16. We've got the mass of the electron, uh, so that's 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Um, and that will give us, once we've plugged in our numbers, an answer for the velocity of 4.2 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. So fairly quick, it has to be said. Uh, but still, less than the speed of light. Uh, if you did the standard uh, national five mistake of forgetting to take the square root to get the final velocity rather than velocity squared, you would find that your final answer would be greater than speed of light and would hopefully set a few alarm bells ringing. Okay, so just to finish up, just uh, show you this. Um, had we been in a classroom environment, we actually would have been able to do this. We would have been setting this up as a demonstration. We have some, uh, some power supplies that will give us large potential differences in the order of 5,000 volts. And what we have here is exactly what we saw in the last diagram. So very hard to see in a picture, but this part here has the electron gun. In fact, you can just see the anode there. So electrons released here, accelerated. And in here we have this target. Now, this target is uh, fluorescent, so it glows when it's struck by electrons. And you can see this blue line. So this shows you where the target is being struck by electrons. And we can see it's following this curved path. Um, difficult to show you this. So I've got a simulated um, experiment here that we can use. Uh, it doesn't look anything like uh, the other device, but it actually is. We've got a charged particle coming in from this side, and I don't normally use this software, so I can't actually remember the charge on the particle. We'll find out soon. We've got two plates, top and bottom. So this one's the positive plate, and this one's the negative plate, and we can see some electric field lines. If I just scroll down a little bit, I've got some controls. I can change the voltage, voltages on the plates. I can change the distances between the plates, which I'm not going to do this time. I can change the velocity, the initial velocity of the uh, charged particle, and I can even change the charge of the particle and the mass. So let's have a look what happens, first of all, when I just click run for the first time. Okay, I'm hoping that if you're keeping the idea of 
uh, gravitational fields in mind when thinking about electric fields, this looks very much like a projectile problem from National 5. So just to bring out the comparison of the projectile problem, we have an initial horizontal velocity. Now, until we get to the electric field, gravity doesn't exist. There's no vertical component of force. Once we get to the field, then we have a constant vertical acceleration caused by the constant vertical force. So in projectile motion in National 5, the constant force would be W equals mg, the weight of the object, and the acceleration would be 9.8 meters per second squared. This one, it varies because it does depend, of course, on the strength of the uh, electric field and the charge of the particle. Um, but the force is is constant throughout, so we get a constant vertical acceleration. And as we get a constant vertical acceleration and a constant horizontal velocity, we get the same distinct pattern as we got from projectile motion in National 5. What happens, though, unlike gravity, I can make, gravi I can make the force stronger. So if I have a larger force acting on the particle, well, presumably I'm going to get a larger acceleration. If I get a larger acceleration, then that happens. Also, unlike gravity, I can change the direction. So now the electric field you see is pointing up the screen. So we've now got the negative on top and the positive on the bottom. And it'll accelerate in that direction. Okay, if I make the electric field even stronger, and I can reduce the distance it travels horizontally. Now, just for the next bit, I'm going to make the field smaller. So let me just quickly check, see if I've got, yeah, that will do nicely. Um, what happens if I reduce the horizontal velocity of the particle? I'm just going to leave you to think about that one for a moment. So thinking in terms of projectile motion from National 5, we would still have the particle moving sideways or horizontally with the same velocity. Oh, but now the velocity is reduced. But because we haven't changed the electric field strength, or in the case of gravitation in National 5, we haven't changed the strength of gravity, it would till, still take the same amount of time to fall. So the time to fall would be the time from here to the time to hitting the plate. So let's have a run and see what happens. So you can see the particle's smaller, still takes the same amount of time to hit the plate, but because it's moving horizontally at a smaller velocity, it travels a much smaller distance. Okay. Um, what I might do, I might actually put the link for this in with the lesson notes so you can have a little bit of a play with a simulation um, you can play with the charge charge of the particle see what difference that makes definitely play with the initial velocity um, particle mass i'm going to leave that one as a thought exercise before you try it what difference will the particle mass make is it the same as gravitation if we change the mass of a, a projectile does that change its motion is that the same here um, the only one I wouldn't play with is distance between the plates. Feel free to have a play with it, um, but I don't think it's necessarily immediately relevant to hire. Okay, that covers everything I want to go through this week. I realise there's more in the PowerPoint. We'll cover that off next week. Um, uh, in the lesson notes, I've set you some practice problems to have a go at. Um, have a go at them, see how you get on. Any problems, let me know and we'll take it from there. Okay, thanks for taking part. Cheers now, bye-bye.